Trump campaign is now reaching voters online. You are seeing the president of the United States. Look at the lines. You join our movement. A lot of uh, President Trump supporters here. Greatest movement in the history of our country. Joe Biden refuses, as the leader of the Democrat Party, to speak out and put an end to the lawlessness. He's ashamed of our country. The VA, uh, as I said earlier, was just a mess under the Obama Biden administration. How many police officers need to be assaulted in the streets of Portland by radical left mobs in order for Joe Biden to condemn this? I don't understand how we have leaders who think that it's okay to tell us as parents that our kids can go and get an abortion without our consent, yet we have no right to keep them home from school. It's just, it's its completely hypocritical. I can't believe that he's calling these folks peaceful protesters. Well, I think Joe Biden is totally on the wrong page on this, and he's completely out of step with where American women are when they talk about how to protect their families. We are one people, one family, and one glorious nation under God. America great again. Welcome to Team Trump Online. There's no magic wand for that, Donald. You can't just make it happen. Well, abracadabra, buddy! They were obviously triggered. Biden is clearly on a teleprompter. This is why I wrote the book Trigger It, folks! Guys, welcome back to the Trigger It podcast. We have an incredible lineup today. We have legendary NFL coach and player, but probably most of you know him mostly as a coach, Mike Ditka of the Chicago Bears. Da Bears, Da Bears, Da Bears. Da Bears. We also have Bill Haggerty running for United States Senate, our former ambassador to Japan, someone who was there uh, in the midst of all this geopolitical stuff going on with China and North Korea. It's going to be an incredible show. Mike, thank you so much for being here with us today. Well, I'm glad to be here. I'm a big fan of your father's. I'm a big fan of this country. I want what's right for this country, and he's what's right for this country. Well, I I appreciate that. I mean, I think, you know, there's no secret that you're known for sort of telling it like it is. And with today and the cancel culture that we've seen out there, I mean, I loved what I saw you say the other day, which is, you know, basically, if you don't respect the flag and the country, get the hell out. I think a lot more people probably need to hear that. Well, you know, I grew up that way. I mean, that's the way I grew up. My grandparents were, came, my grandparents on my father's side came from the Ukraine. So they came from Russia. But they, uh, they, they, they enjoyed everything about this country, mostly the opportunity to work, to have a job, work in a steel mill, work on a railroad. And that's what they did. And they were grateful for it. They, you know, they ended up, and I, I go back to when I was a kid, because uh, I, I, I was at my grandmother's a lot, and they, they lived right down the street. I mean, they, they had a nice little house. I mean, I don't, it, it was very nice. I mean, I, and then they, you know, they may have had a good life. Uh, my dad was, uh, you know, my dad was, he was in the Marines. And he came home from the Marines, and I got to know him real good because he whipped my ass a lot, but that's okay. He was yeah. a good man. He nice. kept me. I kept me out of a lot of trouble. Well, I, I think some kids probably need a little bit more of that. I have a similar story. Obviously, I was you know very blessed uh, as an American, but my mother escaped communist Czechoslovakia, so you know just a little bit west of uh, the Ukraine, uh, and it was the same thing. My grandparents, who grew up in the communism, they understand sort of the incredible blessings we had here as Americans. And my mother was also that sort of old school uh, Eastern European disciplinarian, where when I needed it, she too whipped my ass, uh, yeah. and I. I think, you know, maybe a few more kids in this country probably need a little bit more ass whooping than uh, participation medals uh, and and, and trophies. How how can you say that? 
these poor kids, there's they all oh, don't you, we can't touch these kids. I mean, you, my I, mean, I, I can't even tell you. My dad was a Marine, like I said, and he came. I didn't know. I didn't really know my dad till I was about five years old because he was in the Marines. And when he came home, I don't know if you've ever seen that dress belt the Marines wear, that big leather thick. Well, I, I, I got I got I got acquainted with that real well because that thing found my ass constantly. Well, my mom's weapon of choice was the wooden spoon, yep. but it, yep. but yes, it's my grandmother's. It, yeah. it, it, it's definitely similar, and my and my grandparents had a little bit of that mentality too. So I got it, and honestly, I needed it. You know, yes. I'm not. I've needed it, but I, you know, by by any other standard today, that would not be acceptable. There is no kind of discipline. Uh, everyone wins. Everyone participates. Now, coach, this is maybe something where you can talk about. I mean, you know, sort of this participation medal. Everyone wins. No one has to do anything. They just show up, and and everyone's a winner. I mean, do you think that would have uh, flown when you were coaching uh, football or when you were playing football? Bullshit. That's what I say. That doesn't fly. You play the game and you work as hard as you can at it. You play it as hard as you can and you hope that you're good enough to be on the team, a part of the team. That's all it was. That's all it was for me. I mean, I was a little guy when I was in, uh, until I was, got, got to junior high and I was still a little guy in junior high. And I got my butt kicked. I got a little bigger my sophomore year in uh in high school, in my junior year, I started on a trip on the state championship uh, football team, not because I was a great player, because I had a coach who believed in me and he spent time with me. I, I can I can tell you I can go back to when I was a junior junior in high school. We went to camp. We tra we trained at at, at, a, at, a, at a, one of those camps, and and I he would he would keep me after practice, and and not because he wanted to hurt me. He, he wanted to teach me how to block, how to yep. do the things you had to do to be a good football player. And I learned. And I'm glad he did. I'm glad he took the time. The old Dutchman was one hell of a guy. I had a great high school coach. Well, I mean, that's important. I mean, mentorship is one of those things that's just so important. You sometimes need that person to take you under their wing, you know, show you what's right. But again, it doesn't just magically appear. I mean, you put in the time and you put in the work. Let, let's talk about that. Like, you know, obviously you reshaped the game when you came in there and played and started playing in 1961. You then certainly uh, did it as a coach where you were just known for being tough and strong. You know, what do you see uh, in the differences today in, in say, the NFL uh, with with some of the players, uh, with the attitude towards those players and coaching, you know, what what are some of the differences that you see today? Well, it, it, I had an opportunity. You got to understand, I was the first. Uh, I was the sixth player picked my year, 1961. Uh, I was the sixth player picked in the draft. I was the Bears' first draft pick. Uh, my first contract was twelve thousand uh, dollars at a six thousand dollars signing what? bonus. Wait, wait, wait! Made, twelve thousand dollars. Twelve thousand went, and I made eighteen thousand that first year. So the next, I, I made all pro, and I come back in to get a sign a contract with Mr. Hallis, and he said, "We're going to pay you fourteen this year." I said, "Coach, you can't do that." He said, "Well, I sure can." He said, "No." I said, "You paid me sixteen last year." I said, "I'd be damned if I play for penny less than sixteen. As soon as I said it, he opened the, he opened the drawer, pulled it over, contract for eighteen. And I signed. I never got a raise. I never got a raise. I made all pro. I made rookie of the year. I never got a raise, but you know what? It was okay because I was playing for George Hallis. I was playing for the Chicago Bears, and it was fun. Well, you know, that's great. And I mean, I sort of love that attitude. I mean, you know, obviously with Legend, playing for the Bears, uh, you know, with Mike Ditka. I mean, that, it's just so cool to hear about it. But I mean, when I contrast that, when you're talking about playing and being you know, all pro for $16,000 a year or $18,000 a year, when I contrast that to some of the contracts where I hear, uh, you know, of this systemic oppression of NFL players that are signing, you know, deals for 18, 20, 50, Fifty million dollars. I mean, what's that like for you, looking back and seeing what's going on now in terms of the pay scale? Uh, and I mean, you were grateful to play for eighteen thousand. It seems like so many people in the NFL are ungrateful and feel oppressed playing for eighteen million. Well, that's a shame. It really is. But uh, I, I wasn't underpaid. I, I made a good salary. I was happy. I, I got I got to compete in the league against the best football players 
in the world, I think. Uh, that era I came through in the 60s, some pretty darn good football players. So right. it was a lot of fun. I, and then, you know, uh, Hallis was tough. There's no question about it. But he was fair. And when yeah. you, when you, if you're going to be tough, you got to be fair. He was fair. And uh, I, you know, looking back, I, I don't, I wouldn't have changed anything. I wouldn't have said, well, if, boy, I should make, a, I should make it a few more thousand. No, it, it doesn't matter. It all works out. It all yeah. works out. Well, you know, it, it's interesting you talk about tough but fair. I've always said that sort of about my father, meaning sometimes he's the disciplinarian parent you all need at one stage in your life. You know, he can be tough, he can be fair, but he's not just going to give you the win because you want to win, right? You got to earn that. Uh, and that's such an important thing to talk about. Now, you know, you talk a little bit, uh, Coach, about your background growing up in Western Pennsylvania. Now, this is something that's important for me and for so many of our people who are going to be voting because, you know, Donald Trump, you know, went out and fought for those people in 2016. And then he, most importantly, over the last few years, he's delivered for the hardworking men and women, whether that's coal country, whether it's oil country, whether it's American manufacturing. Donald Trump wants to bring that back. He wants that lifeblood, you know, the, the American working class. He's fought for them. You know, talk a little bit about your thoughts on that, because obviously you grew up around it. You're a legend within that community. Uh, and I think Donald Trump, again, like so many politicians, he made promises when he was trying to get elected. But more importantly, he delivered for those people. You know, talk about a little bit of that experience of what you've seen in sort of, you know, just the hardworking areas of America that have been forgotten for far too long. Well, we, we, we I, I lived, I grew up in a, in a, a government housing project. So you had uh, six, six to eight uh, houses in a row. I mean, stuck together, and they were they weren't even houses, believe me, they were two bedroom or if you were lucky, you got maybe three bedroom, but it, it, they were all stuck together, and it was it was just what we call a housing project. And you know what? It was okay. Everything was good because we had we got up in the morning, we went out, we found a baseball, we played baseball. We found a football, we played football. We, we, we taught ourselves really until we got to, to our grade school and high school, then we had coaches. But I, I, I tell you what, I wouldn't change it for anything. Uh, I think it makes me more appreciative of what I, I, I got out of it, really. Uh, you know, my dad, he worked in the mill. He worked on the railroad. So yeah. he did. He did the same thing. His father yeah. did the same thing. He worked right by his father. I mean, that's what they did. They got up in the morning. They went to work at 7 o'clock or 7.30, took a lunch, broke at lunchtime. They worked till 4, came home. That's what they did. Then they went down to the beer tavern and they had a few, few cold ones. That was that was life, Donald. And, and maybe some brats, right? I mean, I, I keep seeing, yeah. you know, it's seeing the Saturday Night Live. You know, that bear, that bear, that bear, that bear, that bear, that bear. bears. Uh, it, it, it's sort of amazing, but there, there is an element of those are so many of the people, you know, that we've fought for, that my father did. It's why we've brought back manufacturing jobs now. When you see the world in COVID nineteen and the actions of China, you know, it, it's time to make sure we bring back those sort of great American jobs, manufacturing, you know, controlling some of our own destiny. So. You know, Coach Ditko, we have an election coming up in November. Uh, you know, what are some of your thoughts on that? What, you know, what would you recommend to your fans you know, to do coming into it? Let, let's, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it because, again, it's so rare uh, for someone of, you know, your sort of legendary status to be, to go against all of the woke culture that's out there, to, to actually say what they think rather than cower and hide from it. Now, obviously, if they follow your career, they know you're not going to hide from anything, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on what's coming up in November in the election. Well, I'm very proud to be uh, – a fan of your father, uh, I really am. Uh, I think he's a good man. He's a good American. He's good for this country. He's good for what's right, and and, and he's good for the underdog. I believe that. Now, you know, he you you end up with a lot. Of, he ended up with a lot of money, but he made that money. He earned it. He earned it through his jobs, his work, his initiatives. So I I have nothing but respect for your your father. I I, I think. I, I, I'm really, when I say, you know, I, I don't know what I could have done outside of football, but I, I would have hoped that I would have had the initiative to try to do something like that. Because I, I think it, it's important. You don't let, you don't let it just ha go. You, you make something happen. You, yeah. you do some, some things with it. Now, I don't, 
I don't know what the, what somebody would have said if uh, 20 years ago uh, you're, you, somebody would have told you your father's going to be president of the United States, the greatest country on, on this earth. I mean, I, he probably would have laughed. Well, he, he is, and he's the best president we've had in my lifetime by far. Well, I, I really appreciate that. You know, it, it means the world to me. And, and I think you're right. I mean, it's so important to have someone who, you know, like you said, didn't need this job, didn't have to be president, but he's doing it and he's bringing the experience that he got in the real world. You know, not like a Joe Biden type who's been in Washington, D.C. as a career <laughs> bureaucrat for 50 years. I mean, think about that, coach. For 50 years, uh, you know, when you were starting your football, career, Joe Biden was getting elected into office. I mean, that's it's going back a little bit of a ways. If he could fix anything in America, why hasn't he done so in the first half a century of his career? So, you know, it's sort of amazing to me. And I, I just I take that as such a compliment. And I know that my father will as well, coach. Well, it's, it's you know, and, 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 and I, I, I don't, you know, it, it's not about what Biden wants to do. It, it, it's, it's really the fact that that uh, you know, he's there, but he's not there. You know what I mean? He, yeah. he, he nothing. He, there's nothing to it. I mean, it's just a shell. And uh, your your father stood up. He took the shots. You know, and uh, and I, I like that. You know, if, if you get out front, hey, if you're going to be the leader, lead and get out front. If you're going to take the shots, you take them. You, you, he, he, and he survived them. I mean, and yeah. it, really, when you look at this country now, they, they, they really, there's not much they can say, uh, the opposition, because of the job he's done. I mean, really, yeah. we are in better shape now than we have been in, in that I can recall in my lifetime. Yeah, and amazingly enough, he was able to do that despite impeachment nonsense, despite three yeah. years of a Russia hoax. I mean, they threw the kitchen sink at him. I mean, they they threw, uh, you know, a, a Mike Ditka type football team against him, and he managed to still get those things done, uh, which is even more impressive. It's why I'm so ardent about making sure people vote. We got to get back the House. We got to get back the Senate so that we have finally a team that can push things in that direction where you're not fighting against what he wants to do, because what he wants to do. I believe, and it seems like you believe, will be awesome for the country, and that's the direction we need to head. Absolutely. It'll be the best thing for the country, and he's always put the country first, and I think that's the most important thing, and uh, that's why he's the, guy, he's the right guy for the job. Come on. I mean, I, I got nothing against uh, any of the other people uh, running or anything. I, I'm just telling you what. It's kind of it's kind of a, a clear-cut thing to me. You know, it's, uh, hey, he's the right guy. Let him do his job. What he's done doing his job, Get somebody else in there. Fine. Well, I really appreciate that, Coach. It means the world that you'd be on here. Guys, thank you for tuning into Triggered. Uh, legendary Coach Mike Ditka, thank you so much for joining us for all the you know incredible words. We're going to go to commercial break right now. Uh, we'll be back in a little bit, but thank you so much. Thank you very much, Coach, for being here. Uh, you're a legend and a great American. Uh, God bless you guys. Take care. Thank you. I'm Donald Trump, and I approve this message. My administration will take all necessary steps to safeguard our citizens from this threat. Hysterical xenophobia. Be giving Americans a false sense. Is it accurate that if these uh, steps had not been put in place, it could have been two million people dead here in the United States? Yes. No matter how hard they try to stop us, they can't. We built the greatest economy the world has ever seen, and we're going to do it again. <laughs> Together, we're beating back the invisible enemy. What the federal government did was a phenomenal accomplishment. Through it all, the world has witnessed the unyielding resolve of our incredible American people. Promise made, promise kept. And I'm fighting for you, and I love doing it with everything that I have. And you know that. With the grace of God, we will win this war, and we will win this war quickly. And we will make America great again. The radical left-wing mob's agenda? Take over our cities, defund the police, pressure more towns to follow, and Joe Biden stands with them. Cutting police funding. Yes, uh, absolutely. Eliminating cash bail, letting criminals back on the street, violent crime exploding, innocent children fatally shot. Who will be there to answer the call when your children aren't safe? I'm Donald J. Trump, and I approve this message. Guys, just had an amazing conversation with legendary football coach and player, Mike Ditka. 
Hope you had a good time with that one. But now we're bringing in a real friend of the campaign, someone who was there before it was politically expedient for us, someone who was there for us in 2016 when we had no chance of winning and we were going to lose to Hillary, uh, as the saying goes, bigly. Uh, guys, we're here with Bill Haggerty. Bill Haggerty is a true friend of the campaign, someone who's been there when it wasn't exactly politically expedient to do so. Bill is now running for the United States Senate in Tennessee. We're gonna need your help to get him over the line. He's got a primary coming up in about a week. So uh, make sure to get out there early voting. Bill, great to be with you. Great to be back with you too, Don. Well, so, you know, my father, myself, we endorsed you guys. How is the race going? What's happening over in Tennessee? Look, it, it, it's going great right here, but before we get started, I gotta check in with you on what, what just happened with you. You really triggered the folks at Twitter. I heard you got a timeout for, for 12 hours. What, well, what's up with you that? Know, I, I definitely, I got a timeout. I posted a video of a group of doctors uh, with a congressman on the steps of the Capitol building. I just said, wow, uh, this is interesting. This is a must watch. You should see this. I didn't say this is correct. I didn't say this is right over not. I just said you should watch it because it's so contrary to the narrative that we're being you know, force fed. They're just cramming this nonsense down our throat. And it was a group of about a dozen doctors talking about the benefits of hydroxychloroquine uh, in their state. Studies, people who are on the ground doing this stuff every day. And I, I was amazed that that was spreading misinformation. Now, it was interesting. I was on Tucker uh, you know, the other night, and I basically said, hey, here's a thing from the Hill where Twitter literally said, we are not going to take down posts from people in the Chinese communist government spreading disinformation. That does not violate Twitter's rules. Spreading disinformation by Chinese Communist Party government officials does not violate their rules. But apparently me sharing a message, not advocating for it, but just saying, hey, maybe you should check this out and make up your own minds. Apparently that does. So that's the state of affairs uh, in my world. That's what we're all up against uh, because we have such a big hurdle to get over. When you have the social media masters telling us what you're going to hear, what you're going to learn, dictating that message, that's really scary, Bill. And so, you know, this is why we need not just the presidency, but we need guys like you in the Senate. We need to get back the House. Otherwise, it's over. And the me social media masters are going to do whatever they can to try to control that narrative. If they can do it to me, they can do it to anyone. Yeah, it's because you're a strong conservative fighter. I mean, look, the Ayatollah has an account. He can say death to Israel. That's not offensive to them. But just the fact that you're a strong conservative, they're going to they're gonna be shutting you down. Just conservative voices everywhere under attack. No, that's 100 percent true. They can say death to Israel. Uh, they can, you know, literally throw homosexuals off of buildings because that's, you know, verboten there. Uh, that's not a problem. That's OK, according to Twitter. But me passing on a message from a group of licensed doctors that's contrary to the narrative that they would like. And again, the science of this is not settled, Bill. You know, there's a lot of disputes on that. That's what happens in science. So the fact that they would do this just shows they're trying to instill fear in people. They're trying to make sure that people are afraid because that they believe will help uh, you know, creepy Joe Biden, uh, who's hiding in the basement for the last few months. That's how they're going to help the Democrats win. So this is, again, what we're up against. But give us the state of your campaign, Bill, because, you know, obviously it's a big one. The Senate is going to be a very tough race. Uh, you know, the map sort of doesn't work as well as it has in the past for Republicans. I mean, your seat is one that we got to win. Talk about it. Absolutely. We've got to send a strong conservative voice into the United States Senate, someone that's a true conservative, too. I mean, that's obviously why you've been on board with me from the beginning. The reason that your dad endorsed me and actually brought me back from my, my recent post in Japan to come back and run for the United States Senate. We need people that understand and have the competence to deal with the challenges of today. I mean, look well, at I, things domestically. We've got huge I, challenges. Yeah, I, I agree with that entirely. I mean, talk to me a little bit about that. Obviously, you are our ambassador to Japan, right? That's a kind of a big post. You're right there uh, in the heart of so much of the action that's going on. I mean, especially now as you're related to you know COVID and what the Chinese did, uh, lying to the world about it, you know, spreading the misinformation. We just talked a little bit about that. I mean, you were right there uh, in the heart of it. And again, you don't get that post 
uh, if you're not trusted, right? This isn't one of those, hey, you get to be ambassador to a tropical island somewhere. I mean, you know, Japan is a big deal. Anything, uh, you know, yeah. talk about that a little bit and, wh and what you saw and learned over there. Look, Japan's anything but a tropical island. This this is a post that's absolutely critical to our national security. We have more military station in Japan than any place else in the world. Why is that? Because that's the focal point for dealing with the entirety of Asia. So when I got there, we're dealing with North Korea and China every day. Of course, I was there looking China right in the eye. We've now got two aircraft carrier fleets deployed, pushing back on China. That's happening out of Japan. I mean, China has not been our, our, our friend for, for ages. I've seen this, you've seen it, your father's seen it. It's been going on for decades. We've had failed policies. Both Republican and president, both Republican and Democrat presidents, you know, in the past have looked the other way. While China's yeah. continued to mount their aggression and talking about look the other way, Beijing Biden, could you imagine giving him the keys? I mean, we know the financial ties that Beijing Biden has with the communist Chinese regime. There, you know, his family is closely yeah. linked to them, as we all know. We've got to have somebody that actually is clear-eyed and sees the threat that China is. They unleashed this pandemic on us. They've cost us. You know, over 150,000 lives right here in America, millions of jobs. We've got to hold them accountable. Look, I want to make China pay. I know how to hit them where it hurts. We need to make Made in the USA the theme of America again. Well, I mean, I think that's an important point because obviously, you know, the, the Beijing Biden thing, not just the financial ties of you know Joe Biden's entire family. I mean, imagine for one second that I did. I took a billion five. 1.5 billion from the Chinese government. You know, you'd think the media would have a problem with that, but it's okay for a little hunter. Uh, but beyond that, you know, Joe Biden with his push to get China into the World Trade Organization. I mean, his policies enabled China to grow from a country the size economically of the Netherlands to the behemoth it is today. I mean, talk about those policies a little bit and what they did to American manufacturing, American jobs, and honestly, the American dream, which in my opinion has been our only export for the last 50 years. You know, that's very well put. The American dream has been exported. And what we've done is we've opened ourselves, we've made ourselves vulnerable to China in so many ways. I mean, China has increased their military expenditures eightfold over the past couple of decades. Only until your father became president did we begin to rebuild our military. I mean, the strategy out there was leading from behind for eight years under Obama. I mean, the Chinese stepped right into the void there. If you look at what they did with these islands in the South China Sea, yeah. I remember, you know, Xi standing in the Rose Garden right next to Obama saying, we have no intention of militarizing these islands. This is 2015. By the end yeah. of 2016, they'd fully militarized these islands. There are six islands out there that they crushed. These were coral reefs that were destroyed. Millions of tons of concrete were pumped into the ocean. No complaints from the, uh, you know, the, the, the environmentalists there. But they built these massive islands right along the busiest sea lane in the world. They have mil militarized the South China Sea. They're pushing every day, and we're now pushing back. Thank, thank goodness that your father's come into office to really stand up to this for once. And we need to continue to push this forward. And we need allies in the United States Senate that understand the true threat that China is. I mean, we've exported our jobs to China. We've allowed them to have very unfair trading terms with us. And not until your father came into office and stood up to them, we've begun to push back and make real progress economically and diplomatically, too. Look at what they did with the WHO. They've overtaken that organization. Yep. They're, well, they're just, WHO, WTO, the, the World Trade Organization, they've done it all. And you know, if we're still believing that China is going to be a good player in the world, that they're looking out for anyone other than China, uh, you know, I, I, I got I got some swamp to sell you because, uh, you know, hopefully people get that through this experience. And again, I think it's Joe Biden's failed policies. But you have a guy like Biden who's been in D.C. for 50 years. I mean, it's pretty amazing. You know, B Bill, what I love about you is also you, you have a business background. You've done this. You, you've been around the world uh, you know, doing business. So you understand how those things work, unlike a guy like Joe Biden who has just been, you know, he's been an elected official in D.C. since his 20s. He has no idea how these things work. He's never signed the front of a paycheck. He's never created jobs. You know, if Biden could fix the economy, why didn't he do it under Obama? Right. Yeah, we well, you know, why wait a half a century to get going, uh, you know, that, that people can buy this. But again, we have a big hurdle to overcome uh, because of the craziness of the media, because of the you know social media side of things. I mean, they're going to do whatever they can to boost a guy that's been a failed D.C. politician for 50 years. Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, you look at the failed policies of the Obama Biden administration, the slowest recovery on record was coming out of the last recession in 2008, 2009. They put a $1.5 trillion stimulus package in. 
and we had the slowest recovery on record. Very simple, because they grew government at the same time. They added more regulations. They dropped yep. Dodd-Frank on us. These guys don't get it, just like you and I do. I mean, we're business people. We have the yeah. kind of background. We would instinctively known to get the government out of the way, and that is what's happening right now. I mean, the executive order that your father signed as president to come back and take another cut at the regulatory morass, to shorten permitting timelines, to accelerate projects in the pipeline. That's the way you grow the economy. That's what business people do. We need more business DNA in Washington, certainly in the Senate. Yeah, this stuff didn't happen magically because Donald Trump took over. It happened because of good policies that, again, these government officials in D.C., 50-year swamp creatures like Joe Biden, they either don't understand or they don't care because, again, the bureaucracy benefits their friends, all their friends that are getting rich around D.C., creating nothing, building nothing other than peddling influence. You know, that's sort of, uh, you know, the deal over there. So these swamp creatures, you know, this is the last stand of the swamp, and it's why we got to win. Uh, if we can knock them down a little bit, I think we have a chance. Uh, but if we don't, uh, we got big problems. Now, Bill, talk to me one more thing, because obviously in Japan, we're talking about China, but obviously you have a threat, you know, just to the other side of that uh, in North Korea. Obviously, you had to deal with a lot of that. I mean, they were, you know, at, at the beginning, testing missiles, uh, sending them over Japan where you were ambassador. Uh, talk a little bit about that threat, how it's been handled, mitigated or how a relationship maybe has been formed. Well, you think about the Obama Biden administration leading from behind. Every time you know they, they talked about North Korea, they talked they talked about a strategy called strategic patience. That was the Obama Biden strategy for North Korea: strategic patience. I can translate that for you. It means look the other way. That's yeah. why that's why Kim Jong Un was able to ramp up his nuclear program. Not until your father's administration came into office, and I was it was such a privilege to serve there, to fight against the swamp and to stand up for America first again, were we in a position to deal with this. And the Japanese needed American leadership more than ever, because as you said, the North Koreans launched not one, but two intercontinental ballistic missiles over Japan. Then they tested a hydrogen bomb. I mean, can you imagine the tension in Japan, the only nation in the world that's ever been on the receiving end of a nuclear weapon, yeah. is to see what North Korea is doing. Thankfully, in the Trump administration, I was able to stand strong and say, America is here. We're going to defend our interests. We're going to defend the interests of the region. This will not stand. Yeah. Uh, meet with Kim Jong Un to change the terms completely. I mean, we've seen seen a dramatic shift in our policy toward North Korea. Are we where we need to be at this point? No, but we're in a far better place than we were when Obama Biden left the office in 2016. Well, and that's the point. I think, you know, the media likes to conveniently overlook that. You know, I, I don't think anyone's pretending that Kim Jong-un's not a dictator. I, I don't think they're pretending that he's a nice guy. But I think in the grand scheme of the way the real world works, whether it's business or otherwise, having a relationship, having an understanding, having a connection one way or the other uh, is a lot better than just saying, nope, uh, we're going to shut you down. This is what it is. We're not going to do that. That way, you know, when something does happen, you have to make that phone call. At least there's something there uh, to be able to bridge get that gap. But I I think that's so important, and it's one of those things, you know, the morons in the media couldn't possibly uh, ever fathom because, again, they're too busy running either the Democrats, the Chinese communist talking points, you know, or just pushing and shilling for the left. So, uh, you know, that, that's truly sad. It gets back to your, 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 your whole point, though, about having business people in charge. The fact that your father's a business person means he understands instinctively what you just described. You need to have an open parlay. You need to have an ability to deal with it and, and, and bring down simmering tensions sometimes. Your dad stood up to North Korea like nobody's ever stood up to them before. But he opened yeah. a channel at the same time, a relief valve. He knows how to manage a negotiation. Yeah, 100 percent. You know, no one gets rich basically solving the problems of the American taxpayers. They only get rich creating bureaucracy and creating more problems that they can then come in and magically pretend to fix. Uh, so that's pretty sad. Now, we have a lot going on, obviously, uh, Bill, in your Senate race, a lot going on in Tennessee, uh, a lot going on in the world. What are some of the priorities when you get in the United States Senate? What are some of the things that you're going to fight for? Uh, help my father get over the line. The very first thing is certainly standing up. You know, we, we've got to have somebody with the backbone to stand up and hit the mob hard, to push back on everything that's happening here. I mean, it's happening right here in Tennessee, Don. We had a barbecue place called Schufer's. They tried to cater an event for law enforcement here. Chattanooga, Tennessee is where they were. You know what happened? Black Lives Matter finds out about it. They viciously attacked them online. They basically canceled them, destroyed their business. I went over to see them, though. I tell you, the, the, the silent majority is strong here in Tennessee, and I know across the world, across the, across the United States. I went over to visit them 
the next week just to say, look, I've got your back. I'm with you. The parking lot was full. People right. were, you couldn't get in. I mean, th this is the way people really feel. So this cancel culture, this mob that are trying to destroy statues, you know, erase our history, we're going to push back against this. We've got to. And we've got to have voices in the Senate that are strong enough to have the backbone to stand up and do that. And I want to be that senator for Tennessee. Well, I think that's so important. So we've I mean, got to get onto the economic. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, you, you know, your, your father's appointed me to the White House Economic Recovery Task Force, too. We've got to get our economy going again. And, and because I have a solid business background, solid business experience, I've been working with the team already to work through this deregulation process and, again, accelerate all the projects that are in the pipeline, make it easier to get the government out of the way. And the other thing I'm working on is hitting China where it hurts. I want to get their supply chains back. We cannot be dependent on China for our antibiotics, for our medical supplies, for our high technology. We've mm -hmm. got to bring those jobs home. We've got to reshore them. That will hit China economically, and that's going to have a big impact on their malign behavior. Well, I, I think without question, I mean, that, that's one of the huge ones, and that's why you need a business guy like yourself and my father in it. It's why when my father got elected, we were actually able to move the needle on so many economic metric uh, that – we're just stagnant for so for so long. So uh, obviously that's huge. And you're 100 percent right about the cancel culture. And I think that's something that's really important for everyone who's watching to recognize, like this isn't just going on in Portland. Uh, they're trying to do this everywhere. If you don't think that this stuff is coming to your backyard, if you look at this Biden Sanders, uh, you know, communist manifesto joint unity agreement, that's not just, you know, people talking about it. It's on Joe Biden's website. Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is a radical left progressive agenda because Joe Joe Biden's not the guy in charge. It's the other people in Congress, you know, the Hamas caucus uh, and those kind of people uh, yeah. that are that are up there. Those are the people going to be driving this agenda, because I don't think anyone seriously believes that Joe Biden's going to be the guy in charge. Just watch him for five minutes and you realize that's not the case. But we got to be careful. This isn't just happening in, you know, Democrat run cities. Uh, all, it's coming into your backyard. And November 3rd is your last chance to push back before they get their wish list. Amen. You know, it's happening right here in Nashville. Planned Parenthood was just here burning the American flag in our streets. You know, I'm with your dad. You burn the flag, you go to jail. The Democrat solution to all of this is let's defund and dismantle the police. I've got a better idea. Why don't we defund Planned Parenthood once and for all? Yeah, I'm not sure why the American taxpayer is paying for those things. But uh, again, this is what this leftist progressive agenda will uh, will certainly do uh, to you. You get to pay for And again. This is the Biden Sanders unity plan on Joe Biden's website. I'm not making this up. I mean, you get to pay as the American taxpayer. You have the privilege of paying for illegal immigrants to get free health care. Now, you don't get that yourself as the American taxpayer, just the illegals. You also get the, the privilege of getting free housing for criminals coming out of jail. Wonderful. Guess what? I would like American taxpayer dollars to go back to benefit the American taxpayer and their children. I know that seems like a novel concept, but uh, this is the state in which we're at. You're not going to hear these things from the media because they recognize it cuts against Joe Biden. It'll cut against ultimately your competitor uh, for your Senate seat bill. But this is what we are up against. So people have to educate themselves. They have to get around the fake news. They have to figure it out for themselves and they better get out and vote and bring their friends. No, it makes a difference. I mean, it, 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 that manifesto is, is happening all over America. And as you say, right here in my primary, I'm essentially running against the guy that should be in the Democrat primary. He defends Obamacare. He advocates for socialized medicine. You know, he's out funding Act Blue. He applied for a position in the Obama White House. Uh, these are the kind of people that are infiltrating. And they get these never Trumpers around them. You know, he's got a whole team of never Trumpers that are his consultants and staff. And they come in and act like they're Republicans running this party. And it's 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 something we got to stand up against right in our own backyard. So we need to get make sure we get people out to vote, certainly in my primary. As you said, early voting is going on right now. We need them to vote uh, before next uh, next Thursday, August the 6th. That's Election Day here in our primary. One hundred percent. And guys, you know, get out there, vote, vote between now and next Thursday. Vote for Bill Haggerty for the United States Senate, because I can I know the difference. I mean, you're 100 percent right. Your, your opponent, I've never heard of him before. And most importantly, I know he wasn't there for us like you were in 2016 when we had no chance of winning. I know he wasn't vocal about Trump you know, and supporting that agenda throughout. Uh, it's only now when he's ready for Senate. Magically, he pretends he's all, all of a sudden he's on the team. He wants to do all these things that are Trumpian. I've never heard of the guy before. But again, uh, you know, your, your opponents, they'll, they'll run with those kind of things. So 
Tennessee, get out there, vote between now and next Thursday. Vote for Bill Haggerty for the United States Senate. Bill's going to be a fighter for us. Bill, thank you so much for being on here on the Triggered Podcast. Guys, thanks for tuning in. As always, I really appreciate it. You're the best. Get out there. Let's win this thing. We got less than 100 days left. If you want to recognize your country, if you want to enjoy the freedoms that we love as Americans, get involved, call your friends, and make sure you get out and vote. They are going to do whatever they can. The media is going to give Joe Biden billions in free cover up and free attack pieces. We got to function as though we're operating at a deficit because with all of that nonsense, with the help from Hollywood, we are. So help us. Help guys like Bill. We need to control the Senate. We need to control the House. And we got to hold the White House. Thank you very much, guys. We'll see you next week.